welcome. It's our first panel of the Couture Shows, and I have amazing panellists with me. If you'd like to introduce yourself, start it. Um, yes, I'm Alex Fiore, I'm the editor of Love magazine. I'm Charlotte Sinclair, I'm a contributing editor at Vogue, and I wrote the book Vogue on Dior. My name is Mimi Wade, and I'm a fashion print student at St Martin's. So we've got a really great mix um, of people, all of whom have different passions for Dior, which is one thing that I want to start by talking about, which is how Dior is just one of those brands that everyone kind of identifies with in some way, whether it's with the original Christian Dior himself, whether it's with the Galliani, or whether it's now with what Raph's doing, which I think is exciting a lot of younger people, especially students. Um, I think, Charlotte, as you, you are a great authority on kind of the, the original codes of Dior, what's so special about the house? Oh, my goodness. Um, well, it, I think it just introduced a very different model for fashion. I think it introduced a, a fashion, this idea of fashion as a business mm. a, and also fashion as this kind of ultimate glamour. The thing about Dior was that it was always just so, so glamorous. The people who wore it, the looks themselves, the way you could buy into it, the perfume, the advertising, everything built up this idea of this kind of beautiful world that everyone wanted to be a part of in some distinct way. Mm. And is that what couture should be? Because Alex, I know you have a bit of a soft spot for couture. <laughs> you like your things lavish and... Um, I mean, I think the idea of, of haute couture is a lot of people describe it as the Formula One of fashion. I think that's very true. It's the idea of the best of the best at their best. Um, and it's really a, a step above and beyond the ready to wear, even though ready to wear has been kind of achieving couture quality and couture prices it doesn't adhere to the sort of rules that define up couture, which is the fact that everything has to be made completely by hand, everything has to be made for an individual client, um, the, you know, down to the number of work people that you employ in um, the tailoring and the flu ateliers, which are, the flu is the atelier that makes everything that isn't tailoring, um, which includes kind of ball gowns and stuff like that. So I think there is that kind of, those rules in place to define couture and there's also the idea that couture is the way that fashion has always been done. It was born mm -hmm. from kind of Rose Bertin and Marie Antoinette in the 18th century um, through Charles Frederick Worth. So there's this incredible tradition there um, and I think it's important to view the designers today as part of that tradition and the fact that they are working with, with craftspeople that are practicing techniques that originated in the 18th century, which is something that just ready to wear can never do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they can't work with those people. I mean, maybe they can on certain show pieces and certain houses can, um, but the way that couture is constructed is entirely exceptional. Um, mm. I think that's what makes it special. What makes it special is the fact that it is special. There isn't yeah. any way to kind of deny that. It's interesting that you you cite a lot of the things you're doing and it sounds almost like a defense of couture which I think is very natural from someone who adores fashion because they're, it, you always get this argument, is couture irrelevant now, is it dying? Do you think young people are still excited by couture? Because I mean, you obviously spend a lot of time around students, yeah. is it something people still... Oh definitely, I think like the frivolousness and the beauty and the kind of fact that it's like more fine art than it's like wearable art form and then um, you know, it'd probably make a loss on couture these days, but um, it's just the ultimate expression of what the brand is, and then that will filter down to the um, to the ready to wear and um, all of that. But I think ultimately, it's the most exciting for a designer mm -hmm. to be able to earn the right to to do a couture collection. Yeah. Is the, you know the the aim, I reckon. It's, exci it's interesting that you say, you know, it's such a luxury for the designer themselves, because I think that's, I kind of like to speak about Raph, because that's one thing he did mention, I think it's in an interview with Tim Blacks, he says that his idea of couture is, it's all about, you know, the craft, and you mm. can strip away all this argument about whether it sells anymore, or what its position should be, um, in terms of like, accessibility, in terms of fashion, which obviously, couture's never going to be something like ready to wear, but he said... It, it needs to be about the craft, it needs to be about doing something sort of wonderful. And mm. do you think that's where Raph's position is going to be? Or what's his, what's his identifier as a couturier going to be? It's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll the back of one collection, but if we can predict. I mean, I think Dior as a house has always been about 
um, the sort of architecture of fashion. It's very mm -hmm. much what he brought back to fashion when he began, which in his autobiography, Dior talks about the difficulty in finding materials to work with because the materials he wanted to work with and the, the structure of the garments he wanted to work with had, hadn't sort of been used since the turn of the century. Um, I think that's that architecture of clothing is very much what Dior's about and it seems to be very much what Raph has been exploring, particularly the bar jacket, mm -hmm. which is is this here for the overhead camera. <laughs> um, and it, it's that archetypal, incredibly famous cocktail suit um, from that first Dior collection. Um, and it was that idea of redefining the female silhouette and or rather reintroducing a feminine silhouette after the war when women were dressed like soldiers. Um, and it's very interesting to see how Raph has explored that and also how he's explored the a modern interpretation of that of creating the bar silhouette without necessarily the boning mm -hmm. and the horsehair because I've the V&A has one of these suits and it can stand up by itself it's mm. so stiffened and bombasted mm. and there's 40 meters of wool in the skirt and it's this lump of this exquisite <laughs> lump of cloth yeah. um, but what Raph has done is, is taken that and tried to make it modern and also tried to apply it to other things there's a, a handbag called the bar handbag yeah. which has a kind of a, a defined waist um, so I'm interested to see how he's taking those signatures of Dior and really looking at interpreting them in a modern way and that seems to be with sort of a lightness of touch mm, yeah. mm. Um, and a delicacy which is marked out kind of I think his women's wear has become increasingly lighter and more delicate um, during his time at Jill Sander yeah. and that seems to be very much what he's transplanted to Dior um, and I think that's why it feels new even when the silhouettes mm. are, are quite traditional when you get inside these clubs they feel modern mm. and that seems to be more what yeah. And, and I've said it before, the important thing is getting people inside the clothes and sort yeah. of what he wants to do. Mm. Yeah, he's like looking back, but at the same time really going forward and um, like the shapes are all beautiful and like the new look, but kind of so much more wearable, which I think is important for, the, for today mm. and the mm. purpose of, you know, even though not everyone can afford couture, but um, just so much more wearable and beautiful at the same time. Do you think it was quite telling that he did, you said kind of fuse old and new and I think the fact that he's really kind of stuck with this 1947 to 1957 period, yeah. was that what, as, as people who I'm sure have followed Raph's career when he was at Jill Sanders, did people expect him to go for that period of time in the dual house? Do you think you'd have Galliano to? Galliano did that when it, as, on his first um, opening collection, but in a completely different mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. It was far more sort of sexy and um, he kind of used those house stars like the lace but kind of instead of just using lace, got laser cut, kind of white, sexy, the same kind of shape. Um, so it's, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe it's a bit predictable, but at the same time, it's what is so amazing about the brand. It's one of the most like incredible moments in fashion history. So why not use it? You know, and I think it's it's you know returning to core values. I think I yeah. read something um, uh, in Vogue when Raf said that he. <laughs> didn't think that Dior necessarily had a distinct code. You know, you yeah. wouldn't recognise a girl walking around the corner if she was wearing Dior, but if she was wearing Chanel, you would instantly know she was yeah, wearing so Chanel. So I think taking it back, using those specific ten years and specifically this, you know, opening connection as your starting point is is really clever. It's yeah. that's where those values were made. That's where yeah. your code mm -hmm. begins, and you might as well sort of try and use those. And also, I think. That aesthetic, that sort of tailored aesthetic, feels very appropriate for his way of designing yeah. as well. I think it's telling that you mentioned, you know, if you, if you see a girl on the street, you know she's wearing Chanel because of the pumps or the bag or some of those iconic things. Because it's what we were talking about before our stream started, which is how short a span you actually have with the original Christine Dior. Mm. And I think that's something people forget about. Mm, um, Ten years. Yeah. yeah. So he was alive and designing, well, set, set up the house in 1947 and then died in October 1957. So it's an incredibly short period of time in which to create this unbelievably successful multi-million pound earning house mm -hmm. of Dior, which continues today. So it's an impressive yeah, thing yeah. to have done. It's a small archive though. How do you think 
how do you think a designer like Raph will be able to move something like that forward? Do you think the do you think the success of a house with a new designer is always doing something like really staying true to the original codes, or do you think Alex, would you like to see him take Dior in somewhere totally new in a way that John well, Galliano did with his incredible sort of storytelling? Mm. I mean, I think with with Galliano, the interesting thing is that he he always tried to relate it back to Dior, even when he did sort of the you know the tramp collection or the sadomasochistic collection particularly with that sadomasochistic collection he made a point which was um winter 2000 couture um he made a point that it was all the silhouettes were dior silhouettes and that it was about dior's relationship with his mother and the fact that the new look was based on the way that his mother dressed which he saw he then looked at Jung and freud and this idea of a psychoanalytical interpretation of hmm. Dior's fetishization of his own mother, <laughs> which is, it's, it sounds crazy. And when you saw it was kind of girls wearing saddles and manacled, but at the same time for him, that was an, it was an incredibly Dior collection. Mm. And really all of these Dior outfits were corseted and padded and layered. And there was something fetishistic mm. about that. Um, and also something fetishistic about taking women and, and trussing them up in this way that was sort of a, you know, historical clothing yeah. at that point. Um, I think what Raph's doing at the moment is um, to kind of put his stamp on Dior is he's taking the moment of Dior that is iconic. He's taking the silhouette of Dior that is iconic and he's in reinterpreting that. And I think it's a way of melding his handwriting with Dior's yeah. handwriting. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, he could reference the A line or the H line or the Y line, um, which are all Dior silhouettes, but they're not as recognizable not as iconic, yeah. to, to everybody as, as these silhouettes. Yeah. Um, and I think because those Dior silhouettes became kind of an archetype of fashion, not just of Dior, but they sort of represent fashion of that period. Mm. It's very much about tying, and, and also for a lot of people, they, they represent couture as well. I think it's a way of trying to tie that all together um, in the way that, as, as you said, that Galliano did in that first collection. Um, it's a way of, of really cementing yourself and the house together. And then you can go on and explore mm. kind of different avenues, different ways into the house, different facets of the house's history. Um, in the way that kind of Karl Lagerfeld does at Chanel, which is very much about spinning out all of these different interpretations of Chanel. You know, he talks about the, the tweeds and the cashmeres and the jewelled lace, which you wouldn't immediately associate with Chanel. So you kind of get to explore that hidden history of Chanel mm. once the designer in the house had seen as one. Mm. And I think this is a very long way of saying it, but I think probably that's where Raph's going to take us later. At the moment, it's about solidifying his place as, as the the creative director of yeah. Dior and then later on he's going to take us into kind of more I wouldn't say more exciting but certainly more unusual and unusual, more unexpected yeah. places. Yeah. Mm. It's a statement of intent isn't yeah, it? Exactly. This is, this is, of course and there's a little bit of settling the fears of mm. the, the wider buying Dior buying public perhaps that might be a little bit frightened by yeah. the idea of Raph Simmons so that perhaps there's something of that and settling the market as well you mm. know after this period of uncertainty surrounding Dior. I think what he's done is not only beautiful and clever, but also quite safe. Yeah, strategic. Yeah, and quite it is a little bit strategic, subtle perhaps. And kind of quite cool and elegant, sort mm. of, without being too try hard. It's a completely different look for the house. Do you think that will put off a certain group of customers? <laughs> because I think we all agree that it is beautiful and it's really elegant but it, it is a notably different kind of elegance to what we were seeing under John Galliano yeah. and I think we shouldn't get too struck on what we see on the catwalk because as we talked about before that's not what you do eventually end up in the store but do you think there will be a section of Dior's fan base or customer that is somewhat put off by? I mean I, I know this I, I have heard from several Dior customers and they were frightened is probably the word uh, by that first um, ready to wear collection because in their eyes it felt very young and I guess fashion forward to use mm. that horrible expression um, but it was also very short and yeah. these are ladies uh, wealthy women in their kind of 40s 50s who don't want to wear a tuxedo dress that finishes you know just underneath the crotch and that's just not what they want to look like but 
I tried to allay their fears that it, <laughs> it wasn't all going to be like that and, uh, and that this generally was a good thing. They were certainly interested and excited, but from what they'd seen, they were a little bit frightened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think, you, we kind of said this idea of it being younger and there was that definite youngness to, some, to, the, to the lengths and some of the cuts, you know, with the lots of sort of bare arms and bare shoulders. Do you think that's a good thing in a way? Do you think young people are going to absolutely really love this, get excited about it, people are going to want to shoot it? Is that the direction you should I be taking? I think it's now? funny because Raph Simmons is, um, become such a like cult figure amongst the young. Yeah, why um, so I don't know, like, because in the 90s, for instance, like, um, Tupac would like reference Versace in his raps and now like ASAP Rocky is referencing Raph Simmons in his raps and all my male friends are just obsessed and um, it's kind of like whereas you know Versace is so trash and flash and baroque and you kind of expect it of rappers and youth to love that kind of exuberance but um, like our generation is just a bit different everyone's going for the more pared down kind of um, minimal. I mean, I feel like I'm the odd one out, I'm still <laughs> romantic, but I think everyone else seems to prefer the, um, you know, that kind of look. Yeah, the do simplicity. you think that has to do with the way he's constantly, you know, looked at street culture and explored kind of youth, youth tribes? Do you yeah. think that's part of yeah, in his... probably. Because he's always seen as an outsider and you, get, you see that word kind of brought up in a lot of interviews. I think it's quite a lazy sort of description of him because if, if anything, he's the ultimate opposite of an outsider now. He's the head of the mm. house. But why is that label stuck with Raf Simmons as being this person who's a bit outside? Well, I, I do think people talking about the fear of customers, I do think for Dior customers, a Belgian minimalist coming in <laughs> <laughs> sounds very frightening. Yeah. Now, I, and it's particularly coming from Jill Sander, it's this sort of Northern European Sheep. Teutonic mm. um, rigour. And there is a rigour to what he's done um, at Dior. But I, I think, for instance, I was looking at, I, I've talked a great deal about it because I thought it was exceptional, which was the pre-collection that he's done yeah. for Dior, yeah. um, which I think really melded his vision and his rigour with the Dior signatures. It was interesting to see him put a bar jacket with trousers and cut the whole lot in mm. denim and so cool. you didn't even realize it was denim that was the the sort of really exciting thing and the fact that you could imagine a 45 year old woman mm. and a 25 year old woman wearing yeah. that and looking wonderful um, that was what i found very exciting um, and for a, a pre-collection there was stuff in there that looked editorially exciting but at the same time that you wanted to see women wearing mm. um, and it seemed to have that that balance between commercial and creative that often you don't get in pre-collections because they're so focused on, on getting an early drop into a Commercial, show. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so I think it, it's interesting to see how he's adapting himself to Dior, but also how he's kind of adapting Dior to him. Um, it, I think that's going to yeah. be the interesting thing is when you, you're going to start to see his handwriting across the advertising campaigns mm. as we've started to, mm. across the shops and across the aesthetic of the brand as a whole rather than us just seeing collections yeah. from yeah. him. He's like not losing his own vision at all. Like. Exactly. And I, I, don't, I think it's a very clever kind of tightrope act between what he wants to do and what Dior should be. Um, and, and after all, he went in Dior's this incredibly romantic house, and I don't think the work Raph has done to date has been especially romantic because that's not in his nature, which isn't... The first couture show I found, that was incredibly mm. romantic. Oh, I mean the, the background. flowers and the, yeah. the full balloon skirts. Yeah, I, I just think that had a question. You mentioned this earlier when you mm. said, you know, he was moving in a more romantic direction. I think, I think he was moving background. in a, a softer, I'm not sure... I mean, I think saying someone isn't romantic isn't a criticism. I don't think Balenciaga... The, uh, Christopher Balenciaga was romantic in the slightest. No. Yeah. You know, his, his clothes weren't about <laughs> romance. Yeah. They were about drama, and yeah. that's very much what Raph was about. But I think now we're seeing this this softness, which has still has that rigor, but it does have the romance yeah. and femininity. It's totally antithetical to the Galliano idea of romance, which was huge and theatrical. And this yeah. is, as you say, a, a mm. much softer down, vision yeah, and yeah. completely pared down and, mm. and minimal, but still completely beautiful. Mm. And I think the softness, in a way, comes from a different area with rap. There's a brilliant quote from Tim Blanks where he said, he will bring a heart on his sleeve human dimension to this remote and rarefied world. And that's when he's talking mm. about rap working in couture. And I think that's 
quite an interesting thing that I'd like to get your, your opinions on is whether that romanticism and the softness does come from this kind of the the natural humble nature that Raph has and his and this again this idea of him being outside of fashion and do you think that will bring something do you think that's his going to be his new stamp on couture is going to be that more discreet and well I think it won't be I think the thing with with Galliano the thing that was wonderful but also the thing that was very pointed was this chasm between what you saw on the catwalk and mm-hmm. this incredible histrionic theatricality and what you actually got it was, you know, it was never that what you saw on the catwalk translated straight into the shops. There was such a, a trickle Gosh, down. Yeah, he right. talked about it himself, this idea of Couture being this engine that he was pushing the house forward with, and that that would spin out ideas for makeup and for the ready-to-wear and for the accessories. I think with Raph, there's, for instance, looking at that last Couture collection and the ready-to-wear and the pre-collection, there's such a correlation. It's yeah. easy to imagine all of them actually being worn by the same woman, yeah. you know, which I'm sure... You know, if you're rich enough to buy a couture, you'll be rich enough to buy the ready to wear. Um, <laughs> and that there was a, a similar kind of desirability, I think. Um, whereas the, with, as I said, with the Galliano vision, it was very much there was an editorial Dior and there was a commercial Dior, and they were so incredibly yeah. separate. Um, it, it's interesting to see the, how unified Raph's Dior is. I, that I think personally, mm. across him, the accessories and um, you know, for instance, the shoes in the last collection I thought were really beautiful. Mm. Um, and they very much expressed the idea of a modernised version of those 50s Roger Vivier shoes mm. for Dior the, with the comma heel. Um, and so it, it felt like it was all speaking the same aesthetic language. There was no kind of missteps in it. And it goes back to that idea of Dior wanting a customer to be able to either, you know, you're the couture grandee or mm. you're the woman off the street who comes to Paris, goes to the boutique and buys she a pair of the Roche Vivier yeah, yeah. shoes or a fragrance think, yeah. or, you know, a beautiful ready-to-wear outfit that's just on the rail and they just do a couple of fittings and you're done. I mean, that's always been part of what Dior wanted for his label yeah, yeah. and mm. for the house. I would like to talk about that a little bit because you mentioned it at the start of the discussion where you talked about how part of the Dior history is not just revolutionising design, it is revolutionising business, and mm. that is such an interesting part of Christine Dior's tenure, for me anyway, so I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to ask if you think that's something that has to be integral to the brand, you know, pushing an idea of, of how fashion should sell and how fashion should operate as a business, and is that something that Raph has to sort of consider? Mm. But I think, yeah, I think most designers do it naturally now. I don't think you mm. can work in your studio completely um, cut off from those kinds of commercial imperatives anymore but what I think he's done which Alex said which is so brilliant is that it's that it has a it's all in conversation with each other so the advertising mm-hmm. has a relationship to the pre and the pre has a relationship to couture and it, and it has these these links yeah. so it feels like it's all of one conversation there's not this disparity between the, the, the zones of his work and what's the merit of that is that it's not obviously to sell more couture because even if that's a very small yeah. what do you think mm. it's kind of what's truthful saying that? it's kind of truthful because it's like when you go into the shop you'll be able to get something that is reminiscent of the couture mm. it's not like oh here's my beautiful creation and this is slightly less um completely different um thing in the shop it's kind of you know mm. of the same caliber and there's a unity there. Yeah, it means you can buy into it. it yeah. Means that, yeah, that it has. I think the idea of a unified vision is incredibly important. The idea that, that, and it's interesting that you talked about honesty because I think people ask me a lot what I look for in fashion. I'm like, I want honest fashion. I want fashion that isn't pretending to be something it isn't. Mm. And you don't feel like the ready to wear is pretending to be the couture or anything like that. No. It's, but it's all speaking with a, the same aesthetic voice. Um, and that's what's really interesting, I yeah. think, is it, the idea of looking at translating these ideas through the different levels of Dior and to the different customers. Um, and really this, this search for modernity, mm. I think, which is really mm. exciting. Mm. Um, and also something that we've not really seen in Dior. It's, it's I think... It's exciting. Well, because Michel Dior himself was, was obsessed with the past, was obsessed with Belle the, the Belle Epoque and, yeah. and his mother. Yeah. And, and these old methods of construction. Um, and Galliano is, as everybody knows, fixated on, on history. Um, 
and on romance. Um, and it was really interesting to see a designer searching for something modern in the way that um, Yves Saint Laurent did as well when he was at Dior. Yeah. You're getting the, the, the show through Oh, oh my God. slightly holographic. We were saying this before the stream as well, and I love how he's not afraid to sort of reference himself as well as referencing the house, because we talked about in the prequel that beautiful um, dress which was reminiscent of that sort of those colour blocked orange and pink amazing dresses that he did at Jill Sandy. Jill Sandy, yeah. Obviously everyone just fell in love with. And I think that's nice to see at the house, that kind of marriage of ideas. See so already this is recognisably Raph at Dior, isn't it? So even in a few short yeah. months, he's yeah. managed to create something that's distinctly himself. Like yeah, that's menswear easy. tailoring, sort of. He's cut all of the hair off. Yeah. Oh. I think it's really telling that you say that, you know, that he's managed to make something recognisably rough at Dior, because I think that's actually an incredibly hard thing, and it's something people tend to overlook at, how hard it is to, you know, put your stamp on something so quickly and make mm. it really, mm. really, really clear. A little flash of neon and the tights there. Very nice. I like that he's used something as simple as colour, though, to make a point of doing something different. I and noticed that in his first collection a lot, using those more kind of neon colours and the electrics. Yeah, especially on his ready-to-wear collection, mm. that kind of tool. What's your gut reaction to this, Alex, so far? Just staring very closely. I'm really interested that he's cut all of the hair off. I know it's like <laughs> a styling thing, but I think it's... it's do you think they're wearing wigs, or do you think he has actually cut them? It's probably wigs, wigs. Uh, but I don't know where the hair's gone. See, that for me is very romantic, that kind of soft... Yeah, Mary Lawrence yeah. kind of hues, which are quite, you know, true to the signature colours that Christian Dior used. Mm -hmm. And the floral prints, of course, he was obsessed with garlands. Yeah. But then he's putting his own stamp on it completely. And lots and lots of sort of mm. bodices, corseted bodices. Mm. Such great colour combos. And it is so historical in a sense, but it never feels remotely dated. Dated, no. exactly. And what do you think about the presentation? Because I think there is an element to this where it is slightly more theatrical, it's slightly more storytelling. Mm. Galliano did his second Dior collection in a garden, which is quite interesting. That is telling. But it's encyclopedic. It's such a mm. different mm. kind of garden, wasn't it, to this? Yeah, I mean, it was much more... Bells and whistles yeah. and, you yeah. know... Matahari. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas yeah. this is, Literally, you know, no um, flowers at all from the... Yeah. Compared to the last one he did where there was just oasis all over the walls, wasn't there? And completely covered in flowers. Yeah, onions and roses. And mm. Do you think we will see Raph reference Galliano in any, in any more obvious senses? And do you think we should? I don't think so. I think it's interesting when designers are comfortable enough to do that. For instance, when um, I always find it very interesting when Frida Giannini references Tom, Tom Ford, Ford yeah. at Gucci because it's That's such a strongest work when she does that. But it's such yeah. a huge part of, of Gucci's identity. And I think Bar um, Mark Boa, Galliano's the the designer that was at Dior longest, he was at Dior longer than Dior was. Yeah. Um, so I think to completely ignore his legacy and the work Would that he brought shame. to the house, I think it's obviously going to have an, some kind of an influence on you. It's it's at least to show an awareness of it, yeah. I mm. think. Um, but also, it's you need to be incredibly brave um, and incredibly focus not to let it kind of bog down what you want to do. No. Cause and it, it helps that they're two incredibly different voices. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It'll be interesting to see, uh, inspired by Galliano. Mm. I mean, it'd be interesting to see what Raph's take of it, yeah. you know, Galliano, Galliano might do. You know, there's a few parallels though. Like the 
first dress kind of looked a bit sort of bias cut and I was gonna say there's a bit of bias yeah, cutting bias going cutting. on, it's that um, so he's not he's you know, that is quite brave. But I think as well Galliano generally was so influenced by Dior, this that yeah. idea of lingerie dressing. Um, yeah. You know, the, again, the construction. Um. And the bias cutting, even though that is, we would see that as a Galliano signature, that's almost so so much wrapped up in the codes of Dior, you know, the romance, you almost, yeah, it doesn't from, feel like. Mm. Mm. Oh, lovely shape. These kind of again. sorbet colours yeah. are exactly in this picture. The back, he, he has moved this forward from some of the references that he was working with, but it doesn't feel mm. those sorbet, sorbet colours. What year is that from? Is that mm, 1952? And then all oh. this kind of incredibly ornate embroidery flowers uh, mm. on these kind of dresses. Oh, and the, what are they? Are they gloves? Yeah. They're amazing. Also reminds me of... <laughs> it's she says, It's actually beautiful how he's just taken s a tiny, tiny little details and just sort of blown them up. Blown them up. Mm. On these corset tops. Oh yeah. God. Super modern. Oh my goodness. It's quite nice having reference Water books silk. here so you yeah. can yeah. <laughs> get oh, I see that one. Unpick. That's gorgeous. Look at that. Wow. You know, and Dior was always so interested in fabrics. He was completely obsessed with fabric. Yeah. And you can see just the different ways that Raph's using them are totally and That's modern. interesting because that's kind of quite, yeah. again, that's him just draping a piece of fabric around a model. Mm. And there's certainly looks that are reminiscent of that. Yeah, lovely. And also that asymmetry that was so much this part one, of This one, this is what I was thinking. Look. Mm. On the course oh, wow. earlier, basically used sort of yeah. panels, sections of these kinds of embroidery. Even though he's got all of this kind of Swarovski heavily embellished um, clothes, he does it in a way that still remains quite minimal. It's not mm. like too mm. frou-frou because it's sort of isolated elements with blocks of colour. But it's interesting that you say that because when we were talking about the customer base before, you know, you could pick pieces from this that would feel ultra raff for a kind of a young girl who's very into that kind of cool, more modern, minimal yeah. look. Yeah, but then also for the original the customer, yeah. there are things to it that will Oh, wow! <laughs> That's so beautiful. Amazing. The models are having a better time with the footwear than last <laughs> time, which is nice to see <laughs> as well. <laughs> wow, it's kind of like the trapeze style Yves Saint Laurent mm. Yeah. Mm. dresses that he did. And like the... Um, when the hems turned up, was bubble, called bubble, yeah. yeah. Gosh, it's beautiful. Got some very red carpet worthy up in here. Very much so. I like how he's used this kind of traditional embroidery, though, but in neon colours. Yeah. But that's, I think that's what I love that because I think colour is such a simple way to innovate, you know, and, and to do it with the confidence yeah. that he has, you know, putting in these electric colours, and it's so simple. Yeah. Oh, I love that hat. So beautiful. And again, that colour which is so signature. And s structure. I mean, you've got yeah. this, this mm -hmm. kind of architecture, but it looks incredibly soft as well. It's effortless. And that's wow. such a modern way of doing a kind of evening wear, isn't it? Just With a slither. Yeah. yeah. So T-shirt top. It's interesting how many pockets there are in the skirts. Yeah. I'm a big fan of pockets. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I <laughs> just think it gives really it this modern, odd practicality. Mm, yeah. yeah. As if she might actually be wearing a pair of dungarees. <laughs> yeah. Was <laughs> well, if she just wants to slip her Oyster card in. This is a night out. Uh, ID. <laughs> yeah, ID. <laughs> Mobile phone. I like the way, and it was in an outfit earlier, there was just a slice through the skirt, so you had a 
a slice of flesh. That yellow, the yellow dress. That was really yeah. interesting. Really, really beautiful. A lot of the backs have been really stunning, which is the only problem with watching things on it. But it is this very, it's this very kind of fresh sense of clean. something being sexy. You know? Yeah, it's clean. Well, it's not, I mean, the back obviously has always been a focus. Mm. But. Mm. And also, I love that idea of you know wearing your husband's jacket over your board down yeah. or something, you know, and pushing the sleeves up. I'd love to see these clothes up. I know. Clothes. Yeah. <laughs> that's I have a feel. That's what makes them great. When you want to wear something, that's the sign. That's well, you can you see the it. level of detail that's going into these pieces, I which is what couture is all about. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing that we actually can watch this. I mean, back in the day, um, there was so much secrecy covering the couture shows that we weren't even allowed to see photos until six weeks after. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether it's... But that's what's interesting about what Alex was saying about this idea of all his work being, sort of having a really, real strong thread between it, because that... It's a cynical thing. We were talking about this the last time mm. we were on a panel, Alex. It is actually the idea of you know um, a show being a, P a PR exercise for the brand. You know, it's a way of putting forward your vision, and I think that's something that was really great about Raf doing his first Couturist's first show. Is it almost let him sort of put forward this manifesto of what, mm. what his vision was, and sales aside, you know, it was, it's a beautiful way to show what you're going to do. Yeah. What I'm struck by is I'm not, this is exactly what I was expecting, but I'm still surprised by it. Do you feel mm. the same? What are your reactions? Uh, it was a lot softer than his yeah. first couture. It's a lot prettier. Uh, uh, yeah, pretty. There were lots of pretty sorbet mm. colours, pretty embroidery, pretty cuts. Yeah. But at the same time, streamlined and architectural and geometric enough to make yeah. it feel modern and have that element of hardness in it, which you need, or else you just feel like, suddenly if you're a woman who's buying couture, you're not going to be a 25-year-old, and so you don't mm. want to look like a 25-year-old. So it had that sense Quite of ageless modernity. his work, though. I know mm. everyone did pick up on the youthfulness of his ready-to-wear, and I did agree that that did feel decidedly young, but mm. other work he's done before, and... I thought the initial picture in this, it does feel ageless in a sense. Mm. I know you've got a lot of that strapless, but you also have the jackets. I mean, it was, for me, it was quite, as a collection, it was quite satisfying in mm. the breadth. I think it was interesting to see that there was, it sounds like a very old fashioned thing to say, but to say there's day where I can't tell where evening is. Yes, yeah. um, everything's represented. It, it's a decent size, it felt like a proper collection. I mean, mm. You know, you go to some couture shows and you see, you know, a dozen ball gowns and that's it. You know, you feel, or you go to some couture shows and you see 50 ball gowns and that's it. You know, you feel like it's, it's very much pigeonholing itself. Um, whereas, you know, couture clients do buy couture for day wear. They don't just buy yeah. evening dresses. They, you yeah. know, if you can afford to spend 40,000 pounds on an evening dress, you can afford to spend 10,000 pounds on a suit and you will, your instinct is to buy that mm. as well. And do you think this goes back to what Raf was saying about couture being as craft? Because in a way, you know, it's almost it's almost easier to make something stunning and fantastical if you're working with a ball gown, but to make something that's impressive on a couture runway when it is day wear and to make something that is still so strikingly beautiful, yeah. do you think mm. that is the most hard. It's really thing? challenging. I think it's amazing what he's done. So do you think the response will be positive one to what we've seen here? Yes, Should it be? Yeah. definitely. I think that's interesting though what you were saying. I mean something that I always think Dior did was day wear very, very well. It's mm -hmm. all like coats and, coats and separates exactly. and uh, you know, I mean even just that, that's it's a more cocktail wear. But so um, jackets and this kind of suit but still with the kind of back focus back, yeah. and you know the cut, look at the beautiful Super folds feminine. on the skirt. and So it, it was couture but it's more practically minded, I mm. suppose, mm. Um, but it still had that element of craft. So mm. I think what Alex said was absolutely correct. You know, there's there you could see things that you could wear during the day, during the evening, and then the gowns as well, mm. because of course you want the gowns. It's kind of 
kind of meaning of couture sometimes, but there was the, it's all been represented mm. cleverly, really yeah. cleverly, and it all has that fluidity yeah. of thought between the processes. Yeah. I think it's something that's for a, a true couturier, someone that's very strong is someone that can adapt what they do to those different elements. And you look at something like Chanel, and for me, Chanel is always very have, I would it's roughly 50-50 between day mm. wear and evening wear or day wear 50% and evening and cocktail is another 50% yeah. and it's quite telling that Chanel is one of the few couture houses that actually turns a profit with their couture operation mm. when you think they're actually catering to something that no other house is really catering to um, in the same way that Yves Saint Laurent always used to have such an incredibly strong day wear offering through his collection and I think maybe because couture has now become relegated to to dressing red carpets rather than people. Yeah. Um, it's it, sometimes that's lost because, as you were saying, that you know, day wear isn't the flashy stuff. It's not the stuff that's going to make the front page of a newspaper. Yeah. Um, that it's not what's. It's a sad thing to say. It's not what is going to get people excited, but it's what's going to actually sell to people. It's yeah. what it's what these incredibly rich women will want to have made for them. Mm. Um, so I think that's that's an interesting element to take from it as well. Is this? I, I was interested to see his focus on creating a wardrobe for yeah. his couture customer mm. rather than just offering a lot of even dresses. And that feels very yeah. genuine. I think yeah, you know, it takes couture out of just being this thing that I think people have kind of become a bit like what's the use of mm. what's the use of it you know when you when you can look at a collection as you said and there's a there's a definite sort of not a story in the sense of a, a fairy tale but a story in the sense of what does a woman do in her life it mm. does make couture seem instantly more relevant and accessible aside from the price point and I think that's something that's quite striking and yet it retains that element of magic which it needs mm. to have mm. or else it's just a ready to wear collection you know so it has this kind of focus on detail and colour and quality and cut and beauty um, which you need uh, mm. there was so much there that you could oh, see it <laughs> translating <laughs> um, to day wear so it's early on to say but to wrap up our discussion what do you think I know it's only after some four four collections one of them being pre-full but what do you think are going to be the RAF codes that do or what are the RAF signatures so far tailoring definitely yeah. tailoring um, I mean actually lots of trousers I saw in this one mm. and in pre yeah really a really kind of slimline trouser worn with a bodice with a very kind of tight sort of corset style top um, cashmere t-shirt type tops worn with the kind of balloon skirts I think that's definitely become one of the Dior RAF Dior codes yeah. um, it's interesting colour. because I'm not sure how much we can talk about what he did at Jill Sander but these are all things that I have know. actually grown out of what <laughs> yeah. he did at Jill Sander exactly, yeah. But then again, Raph's never designed women's wear under his own name, so it feels like this is just what Raph believes a woman should look like. Mm -hmm. um, when we were talking about the day where I was thinking about that Jill Sander, do you remember the Anna Winter, Lara Stone, Jill Sander collection that was all tailored suits? The very oh, short, yes. yeah, short yeah, yeah, tweed yeah, suits with yeah. the flat shoes. And there was no evening wear in that yeah. collection whatsoever. So it, it's very much that is kind of his, I guess it's dress, it's, it's dressing women for real life. Mm. Yeah. The interesting thing since he's come to Dior is that increasingly that real life does include evening as well. There mm. are these amazing evening dresses that he's never really had. I'm not. I wouldn't. Not sure if you'd say had the opportunity, but maybe he's never had this kind of couture eye and this, this couture craftsmanship to be able to create those dresses in the way that he wanted yeah. to, which now seems to very much be part of, of that vision that he has for Dior. Mm. Um, so it, it's an interesting idea that he's, it's stupid to say that he's dressing women for day and for evening, but it's, it's no. so few designers do that, yeah. they're so compartmentalised into one or the other. It's interesting to see someone that's actually trying to tackle dressing a woman for her life. Mm. Yeah, it's like super feminine, but at the same time there's an element of androgyny there with the kind of um, not enhancing the female form with those kind of t-shirt-like silk tops but then with the really feminine kind of fitted to the bottom um, very evening wear kind of um, ball gowny style skirts and the mixture between the two mm. kind of keeps it quite cool and modern and mm, fresh yeah. but at the same time you know something that you could wear in the evening very very easily but um, you know looking at the past but without kind of 
you know, he's made his own mark on history, but without being, you know, repeating what's already happened. Um, and it's telling that he loves to look at the street because I remember there's a, there was a Chanel collection with Karl Lagerfeld, I don't know, I think it was a Kachir collection, where he looked at the way young girls on the street dress, which is all those really skinny trousers with the t-shirt tops and the flat shoes. And it, there's almost something wonderful about the way Raph does that because it's not looking at kind of these youth tribes in the way he used to, but it's still looking at, you know, what you see beautiful young women walking around in, and these kind of little t-shirt tops and the mm. skinny trousers under yeah. the skirts. And it's quite an eclectic mixture of yeah. silhouettes that he's used, but I think it works really, really well. Yeah. But I think as well, talking about, you know, those t-shirts with a ball gown skirt, it is that idea of you take a menswear designer and put them in a quintessentially <laughs> feminine house to see him mixing that masculinity with femininity. Um, is, you know, there's, there's that interesting juxtaposition and Dior used to have elements of masculinity in the way that he would use kind of Prince of Wales check and, and masculine tailoring yeah, fabrics. Yeah. Um, Pinstripe. And exactly. Yeah. But I think the way that Raph is doing it is, is bringing a real sense of, of the androgynous to it, mm. which even when Saint Laurent was there, he didn't really inject. Yeah. And I think it's, it's quite difficult with a house like Dior, which is built on, on this, which is, you know, the female form divine mm. there's yeah. no avoiding it but even just trying to make it modern by by mixing in elements of masculinity you know the putting trouser pockets in an evening dress yeah. Yeah. it's it's very interesting to see him it's it's almost a, I, I mean I would use the word struggle but I mean in a, in a good way there's almost this fight between masculinity and femininity yeah. and there's a tension between them and that's actually what makes it feel contemporary I yeah, think. Yeah totally and it's also I think what's really exciting is it feels like he's discovering new codes as mm. well you know you just mentioned that androgyny and but even little things like the way he looked at the back which is something you know people who are interested in fashion interested in dual think of that as a dual code but it's it's something fresh and it's something exciting and it's not that just that bar jacket. It's almost like he did that and he did it beautifully. Yeah. And now he's being like, I'm going to pick through this history and get all these amazing things, like the androgyny yeah. that other people have, have overlooked and may have forgotten. It's just, it's just really clever really designing smart. because he, obviously he, he's very familiar with the archive, but even what you were saying, you know, the focus on the back. Well, what does he do instead of sort of over complicating it? He just cuts it away and just leaves mm. it as bare flesh. I mean, that's completely, feels completely modern and very, very clever. It's, clever designing. Should we give him a round of applause then? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.